Wonderful. So for last talk of uh, this conference, we'll stay on the topic of uh, diffusion models with uh, Senior Chevy from Princeton. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you for bearing with me for the last talk of the conference. And thank you to all the organizers. This was really fantastic. OK, so diffusion models make pretty pictures. And we've heard a lot about them. So I, I want to talk about um, how we can try to study them mathematically. So the, the mathematical foundations, we start with some forward diffusion process, which uh, for the sake of theory, we just consider the simplest kind of canonical one, which is a forward uh, ornstein ohlenbeck process, or OU process. So this is an SD whose stationary distribution is standard Gaussian. And this uh, process is initialized with uh, the data distribution, which will be p data. So you should think of p data as like, let's say, your distribution over images. So I start with image, and then this process is turning it into noise. And what's really nice about these diffusion models is that there's a way to write down an SD uh, that implements the time reversal of the forward process. So this time reversal, uh, you can see first you take this coefficient of minus xt and you change that to a plus sign. But then there's this extra drift term that you have to add, and that's the score function. So this is the gradient of the log density at time capital T minus little t. Uh, so yeah, um, in this backward SD, the time is running backwards. So you start off with time capital T, and then you run um, OK, so I, like the, the time for this reverse process is like t, capital T minus the time in the, in the forward process. So you initialize this reverse process with the output of the forward process at time capital T. You run this backward SD, and then you get a sample from the data distribution. So this is the diffusion model. But uh, we cannot implement this exactly. So in practice, uh, we're going to incur some sources of error. And this is kind of what we want to study in this, in this talk. So the first source of error is that we don't have access to uh, P sub capital T. So this is the distribution over noisy images, but we don't have uh, a formula or anything like that for the, the distribution of the images themselves. But we do know that the stationary distribution of the forward SD is standard Gaussian. So we hope that if we take capital T large enough, then P sub capital T is close enough to Gaussian so we just can initialize our reverse process at pure noise. So that's the first source of error is initialization. The second one is that the score function, grad log p capital T minus little t, this score function has to be estimated from the data. So we're going to replace this with our, our um, approximate score. And then this third source of error is that this, uh, this SD is nonlinear. We cannot implement this exactly. So we will also discretize this process in time. So I'll choose some step size h, and then I'll freeze the value of the score and the evaluation of the score at the largest multiple of the step size h, which is smaller than my current time. Okay, and then we want to track how these three sources of error propagate into the error of the, of the sampler. Are there any questions about, about this setup? OK, um, just a quick slide about uh, how you actually learn the score function. Is, uh, is this technique of score matching. So what you can do is first set up this problem of trying to learn the score function accurately in L2. So suppose that I have some class of functions, which is uh, this uh, fancy f. So think of f as, let's say, a class of neural networks over which you're going to optimize. Then my objective is just going to be to find the the function st in my class f that's closest to the score function in L2 distance. So this objective is not really, uh, you can't really train this objective uh, using your data. But the magic of score matching is that there's some integration by parts identity that you can do to reformulate this objective. And how does this objective look like? Well, so first, uh, you take x0, which is drawn from your data distribution. So you sample like an image. and then you add this, um, you, well, you rescale the image a little bit, and then you also add some independent Gaussian noise. So this xt is like a noisy version of your image. 
And it turns out that the objective up top is equivalent to minimizing this objective down below. So what this uh, objective has an interesting interpretation. This st that you're learning is a function of the noisy image. So you're trying to find a function of your noisy image that somehow predicts the noise that you added. So you're trying to learn a denoiser, in other words. But the nice thing about this objective is that you can convert this into an empirical loss just by sampling a bunch of images from your training set. You can generate the noise. So you can generate these noisy images xt. You can replace this expectation with a, a sample average. And then you can train your uh, neural networks via whatever optimization algorithm you'd like. So this is how the score matching is done to train these diffusion models is basically via fancy versions of this. Okay, so that's um, score matching. Of course, like the actual problem of quantifying how well you learned a score function, that requires some understanding of, of like, the training dynamics of neural networks. This is a difficult question that I don't know how to answer. So for this talk, I'm totally going to punt on that question. And we're going to instead say, suppose that you've learned the score function up to some accuracy. Then what can you say about the final sampling guarantee? Uh, so this was our. Uh, our results uh, together with these collaborators while I was doing an internship at Microsoft Research. So we have two assumptions. The first one is that the score function is uh, Lipschitz for all time. So this is uh, not, not exactly a realistic assumption, especially at time zero. This is saying that the score function of your data distribution has a, a nice score. But this assumption can be relaxed. I'll discuss this in a little bit. And also, this is just the cleanest assumption for the, for the theory. And then the second one is I'm going to assume that I've learned the scores well up to uh, error epsilon in L2. And this makes a lot of sense because this is exactly the objective of score matching that we started with. And by the way, to connect with uh, Yu Chen's talk, this first condition of Lipschitz score, um, I think she called it like, path regularity. And the uh, second assumption of learning the score up to uh, error epsilon, this is like the posterior mean consistency. She also had a third condition which is, um, uh, sorry, no, the path regularity is different. Yeah, OK, she, she assumed that the, the m hat that you learn is Lipschitz, and then the posterior mean consistency. So that corresponds to these two conditions. She also had the path regularity, which uh, I'll come back to later. Um, yeah, and then the, the result is that under these assumptions, if you choose the sep size correctly as prescribed by the theory, then you can output a, a distribution, which is epsilon close in TV distance to your data distribution using uh, this number of iterations, L squared d over epsilon squared. So let me make a couple of remarks about this, about this theorem. So the most interesting part about this theorem is that you can, you can get these uh, iteration complexities that scale polynomially in, in these problem parameters. But you do not have to assume uh, that the, the data distribution is log concave or satisfies like the log Sobel of inequality or other kinds of assumptions that you need in uh, MCMC theory to guarantee fast mixing. So this is kind of saying, even if your data distribution is somehow like, multimodal or these other kinds of challenging distributions for uh, standard MCMC samplers, diffusion models can kind of overcome this. And, uh, the reason why they can overcome this is that they're kind of doing some kind of annealing process. So when you pass your distribution through this forward process, it becomes a nice isotropic Gaussian. And then you kind of, when you follow the reverse process, you're uh, slowly like going back to your original distribution. Of course, there's a catch, which is that all of this is assuming that the score function must be accurately learned. So that's really the, the hard part about, about this problem. Um, now, let me also mention that there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of literature on this now. So there were a lot of previous work studying this. Um, what was kind of new about this theorem, and it was also concurrent with this, uh, this work by uh, uh, Li, Lu, and Tan, is that we kind of removed all the assumptions that you need on the data distribution. So again, you don't need lock concavity or, any, or anything like this. And then there's also ways to kind of remove this assumption that your data distribution has a Lipschitz score. Uh, basically, this is because the forward process is regularizing. So if you 
evolve your distribution for a little bit of time through the forward process, then it's already kind of regular enough to have this score, and then you can, you can get some pretty refined guarantees. These are sort of the state-of-the-art results now. And um, so although, uh, so let me, let me just emphasize one more time that really the catch here is that you're assuming that the score function is, is learned correctly. And of course, like, why, why would you expect this to hold? We don't really know. But the reason why we wanted to kind of establish this theory for diffusion models is somehow I didn't, I don't really think that a mathematical theory for diffusion models could really begin until you at least have this kind of sampling guarantee. But there have been some works that try to uh, address the, this problem of learning the score. So we're slowly making some progress. And what I think is exciting about this line of work is that some of these works establish settings in which you can actually like provably learn this score function. And you can achieve with diffusion models or variants of diffusion models sampling results that could not be achieved using prior uh, MCMC samplers. So these are just some examples in recent works. So there are some recent papers that show that you can learn Gaussian mixtures by learning the score function and using diffusion models, which is pretty cool. Um, this line of work on non-parametric settings, this is kind of investigating questions like what's the minimax rate of learning the score function. Uh, there's also this line of work by Nima Anari and collaborators at Stanford, which uh, tried to develop this reduction from like if you have this combinatorial problem where you have a fast parallel algorithm for counting, then you can use diffusion models to turn this into a fast parallel sampler from, like, say, the uniform distribution over this, uh, over this combinatorial object. And then there's also um, works using this to uh, sample from spin glasses or like the spike Wigner model, as we just saw, and then other works. But there's still a lot more to learn about, about this score function. So before I continue on, are there any questions about this kind of result? No, okay, so I wanted to give like a quick outline of the proof of this theorem. And the reason why is I just want to convince you that actually the proof of this result for DDPMs is uh, in fact like really easy and in some sense kind of elegant. Like you could probably teach this in a course if you wanted to. So how does the proof go? Well, uh, this is really the quantity that we want to bound. So ROU is a reverse OU process. This is going to be my acronym for the ideal process that we want to emulate, whereas ALG is the algorithm. So remember for the algorithm, we have these three sources of error, the initialization, the discretization, and the score score error. And what we want to do is compare the TV distance between the ideal process, which is started at PT, versus the algorithm, which is started at the standard Gaussian. So the first step is just a simple triangle inequality to get rid of this initialization error. Uh, so you, what you do is you introduce the, um, the algorithm started at PT, the ideal initialization, versus the, uh, the algorithm started at, at the standard Gaussian. And this first term, uh, the first term, you can just use the data processing inequality for the TV distance because you're just applying the algorithm started at two different measures. And you can bound this first TV term just by the TV distance between PT and gamma. But uh, I said earlier that the stationary distribution of the OU is the standard Gaussian, so we expect this term to be small. And indeed, from uh, results about the convergence of the OU process, this term actually decays exponentially fast with respect to the time that you run the forward process. So by taking this time to be, let's say, like logarithmic, then, uh, then that makes this initialization error very small. So that, that already handles the first source of error. And then, then we have to handle the rest. And the main tool for this is uh, Gersana's theorem uh, from stochastic calculus. So I'll explain this. So we have these two processes. And we want to understand how they differ. The first is the ideal process, the reverse OU process. And uh, in comparison, we have the algorithm, where the algorithm, first of all, it replaces the score function with this learned score, S. And then it also, uh, I replace this T with this T minus. So T minus is just the shorthand notation for the smallest multiple of the step size 
that's less than the current time. So those are the two errors here. But the nice thing about this is that um, these two SDEs, they just differ by their drift term. And by drift term, I mean the, the coefficient in front of dt. So the reason why this is nice is because of um, you can now apply stochastic calculus, which tells you that if you have any two SDEs driven by the same Brownian motion, and they only differ by the drift term, then actually if you look at their laws on path space, so this is the space of all uh, continuous paths over the, over the time interval, then the, the laws on path space are actually absolutely <laughs> continuous with respect to each other. And moreover, there's a formula that you can write down, an explicit formula, that tells you what is the um, radon nicotine derivative between the laws on path space. So this is the content of Gersonov's theorem. Here's the expression. If you consider the path measures, let's call them p and p hat, then you have some explicit expression for, for what this, uh, for the change of measure between these two um, path measures. Okay, and the, the reason why this is nice is once you have a formula for this change of measure, then you can just compute the KL divergence directly. So to compute the KL divergence, you take the log of this density ratio and then you take the expectation. And when you do that, this first stochastic integral drops out because uh, stochastic integrals have zero mean. And you're just left with this simple formula for the KL divergence. It's just the expected integrated square difference of the drifts of the two processes. And uh, a bound on the KL divergence, of course, upper bounds the TV distance by uh, thin scarce inequality. Okay, and then from this point on, now the proof, you can just kind of um, bound this term quite directly. So I'm not gonna show all the calculations here, but from this point, it's just kind of straightforward to, to control these terms. So a couple of uh, remarks about this. The first nice thing about this proof is that this, uh, when you do Gersonov's theorem with this order of arguments for the KL divergence, it turns out that the expectation that we're taking here is taken under the true ROU process. And the reason why that's nice is that uh, the, the ROU process, because it's the time reversal of this forward process, uh, ZT is always distributed as P at time capital T minus little t. And because of that, when you add and subtract the, the score error, then you can always take the score error, um, you're always computing the score error where the expectation is taken under the correct measure. So you just pay for the score error under the, the true distribution, which was exactly our assumption. And this is nice because like, you might expect that the following happens. Like the score is a little bit incorrect, so uh, my algorithm makes a mistake. And now that my algorithm has made a mistake, the law of my algorithm is no longer equal to the law of the reverse OU process, but I only had a score matching guarantee under the true law, not under the law of the algorithm. So you might expect now that I've uh, drifted away, the score error becomes worse and worse, and then there's some kind of catastrophic failure, but that doesn't actually happen. When you do this argument, the score errors are always taken under the, the true law. So that's one nice feature. The other nice feature about this is that, well, you can see the, this error is just an integral from zero up to time capital T. So the discretization error really only grows linearly in the time capital T. And we said that because of the fast convergence of the OU process, capital T can be taken, say, logarithmically in, in the problem parameters. So this discretization error is pretty mild. And this linear dependence on T comes from Gersonov's theorem. But let me contrast this with what happens if you do a coupling analysis. So a coupling analysis would be, I just compute, let's say, the Wasserstein distance between the algorithm and the reverse OU process. The problem with the Wasserstein analysis is that these processes are not contractive. We're not assuming that the, the score functions um, will cause your process to contract. And if you don't have a contractive process, if you just do a coupling analysis, then the errors can kind of blow up exponentially in time. So if you do this Wasserstein analysis, you'll get bounds that scale exponentially in T, whereas the, the, uh, this kind of argument only scales linearly in T. Yes? Um, what about the integration? Because if you start, if you don't start with the integration? 
And so the question is, like, what about initialization? So this was actually handled just via this triangle inequality. You can separate out the initialization error, and that's, that can be made small. So what happens if you do this analysis? You get this, uh, you get this bound on the error that you make, which just splits cleanly into these three terms. So the first term is this exponentially decaying term. That's your initialization error. Then you have these terms that depend on your step size h. That's your discretization error. And then your third term is uh, there's an error that, uh, just because the score function that you're using is, is not accurate. So you pay for the score error epsilon times a square root t. Uh, and then you can see that in order to get a sampling guarantee up to the score error epsilon, then the complexity for this is L squared D over epsilon squared, roughly. Are there any questions? Uh, yes? So here the epsilon you have is the same as the score error, because there, mm -hmm. there is no need in having more iterations than this, because then it becomes dominated by score error. Yeah, correct. So we can't hope to, at least theoretically, like get better sampling guarantees than the score error. We're, we're always bottlenecked by that. Oops, not my phone there. Any other questions? Okay, so this was the, the result for the diffusion models, the stochastic implementation of them. Uh, I want to talk about a more challenging situation which is there's actually a deterministic implementation of these diffusion models, which is known as the probability flow OD. So to contrast, up top I put the backward SD that we implement in diffusion models, but it turns out that you can also implement this purely as an OD. There's some kind of um, trick you can do where you kind of move the Brownian motion as uh, another score term, but that's fine because we're already assuming that you learned the, the score with the neural network. So this, OD implementation is using the exact same information as the backward SD, but now we have a, a pure OD. So Nick, Nick also mentioned this in, in his talk. And what's appealing about this is that, well, it's kind of known in numerical analysis that discretizing SDs is kind of sucks, but discretizing ODs is much better. We can hope that the probability flow OD will lead to much better guarantees. As for like whether or not it works in practice, it depends on who you ask, but it seems to work reasonably well. At least um, it works well enough that I wanted to know, can we, can we at least explain why it should work? But the, the main challenge here is that this uh, Gersonov theorem that I used in the previous proof, this is really specific to SDEs. And since we don't have Gersonov's theorem anymore to analyze this OD, then all we have left to fall back on is this kind of naive coupling analysis, which will lead to bounds that depend on exponential of the Lipschitz constant times, times capital T. Let me mention that this, this uh, exponential dependence, it's not really as bad as you, you might think at first sight, because first of all, capital T, as I mentioned, can just be taken to be logarithmic. Um, so this exponential, well, it, it could still be exponential. It might be something like, uh, dimension to the power of the Lipschitz constant or something like this, which still seems kind of bad, but you can also compute what this looks like in concrete instances using the fact that the Lipschitz constant also gets better along the forward process. And in some cases, this exp of LT factor is actually just polynomial. So it's, it's not so bad as you might think, but it's still some kind of unnecessary overhead. And I was curious about whether this is a real difference between the the stochastic implementation and the deterministic one. Yes? Wouldn't you expect in general in high dimensional settings for the Lipschitz constant to scale like square root of D or something like this, that this would be exponential in the next? Um, yeah, so I, I think you could compute in, let's say like your initial distribution is Gaussian and you compute exactly what is the Lipschitz constant along the forward process. The Lipschitz constant is getting better over time and then when you integrate all these Lipschitz constants over time and you compute what this term is, it's actually not so bad. 
But still, I wanted to. I wanted to see if we could avoid this. So there, there are also like some prior works trying to study this, uh, this um, probability flow OD. So there's, um, as I mentioned, a lot of works that kind of get results of this exponential of LT type, and there's other works that cover like variants of these models. What you can do is instead of looking at the Lipschitz constants of each of the scores along the trajectory, you can just posit a Lipschitz constant on the entire flow map, and then you can get a bound in terms of that. But uh, if you only have information about the Lipschitz constant of each of the scores, then the worst case bound for the Lipschitz constant of the flow map is, again, exponential of LT. So it doesn't quite address this question I had. There's other works that show that this kind of dependence can be avoided, but they need stronger assumptions on how you learn the score. So in particular, they, these works assume that you learn the score up to higher order derivatives. So not only is your score accurate, but the Jacobian of your learned score is close to the Jacobian of the, of the true score. So that, that seems like a strong assumption to me. Uh, I don't know whether we can expect this to be true in training. But I shouldn't criticize too much, because I'm also about to make some pretty strong assumptions. Let me also mention um, the situation gets better if you do add a little bit of stochasticity. So this was also suggested in this paper by Song et al., uh, which is they, pr they propose this framework, which is called predictor corrector. So what, what is predictor corrector? The predictor step is just the probability flow ODE that I mentioned before. So this ODE it advances the reverse time a little bit. But then you alternate these predictor steps with, with uh, what are called corrector steps. And what the corrector steps use is they take an advantage of the fact that we've already learned the score function. And then they use this score function to run an MCMC sampler for a few steps, which has as its target distribution the, uh, the current distribution we're supposed to be at. So you can use an MCMC algorithm, for instance, like Langevin. So what, what does this look like? So let's say that uh, this side of the stage is uh, time zero in the reverse process, and I want to get to time capital T in the reverse process. So what do I do? I start at a Gaussian. I run my predictor, the ODE, and I advance a little bit. And then I stop, and then I try to correct for any errors I've made by running an MCMC sampler with the, with the learned score. So when I do this corrector step, I'm not advancing in reverse time. I'm just trying to get closer to the distribution I'm supposed to be at right now. And then you do the predictor a little bit more, and then you stop, and then do the corrector, and then so on until the end. So the, the idea is that this corrector step somehow should add a little bit more regularity to this, uh, to this process. Okay, any questions about, about this? OK, um, let me check the time. Uh, OK, so what, what can we say about these? So uh, most of the ideas I'll talk about were kind of already done in this paper uh, up top. But um, I'll talk about some refinements of these results, which are kind of not, not really released yet. In, in the second paper, this, this is kind of the right framework in which to view the, the arguments of this first paper, and it leads to slightly better results. But anyway. OK, so this is what we can say about the probability flow OD. So the, the colored bits of this theorem, these are the parts of the theorem that are worse than what we had for diffusion models, the stochastic implementation. So first of all, instead of just assuming that the true score is Lipschitz, I also have to assume that the estimated score is Lipschitz. I also need to assume, uh, instead of an L2 bound on the score error, an L infinity bound on the score error, which is quite strong. Uh, and then instead of getting a TV guarantee, I get a guarantee in what's called the bounded Lipschitz distance. So what is the bounded Lipschitz distance? It's just uh, the soup overall test functions, which, have bounded, um, which are bounded and also have bounded Lipschitz constant. So the reason why this, uh, this shows up is because this is weaker than both total variation and Wasserstein. But anyway, it's some, some kind of notion of distance. But the, the good news about this theorem is that the iteration complexity only scales as square root of d rather than linear in d uh, as before. And the intuition for this is precisely what I mentioned, that 
you expect better discretization from ODs rather than from SDs. Okay, so you can, you can say something about the probability flow OD. As I mentioned, if you add stochastic corrector steps, the situation becomes better. So if you add these corrector steps in the right way, it turns out that you can remove a lot of the unsatisfactory parts of this theorem. In particular, instead of assuming these L infinity bounded score errors, you can go back to the L2 bounded score errors. And you can also replace the bounded Lipschitz distance with total variation. Actually, like this total variation should really be KL. And I think I know how to do it, but it's like not really worth it. Um, but yeah, so this, but it kind of fixes the, the unsatisfactory parts here, but you get the same iteration complexity out, uh, score root D. Uh, yes? Mr. Kahn, you followed this. So you mentioned that you get the better dependent in D because you look at the ODE instead of the SDE. Mm -hmm. Can I think of the, the, the Lipschitz condition that you have on the learned score function now in terms of price that you have to pay for that? Did you move the noise into? Uh, so I don't want to. I don't want to speculate too much. It's like, just um, when we do the analysis, we kind of need this extra condition, but I don't know if it's real or not. Okay. You might. You might need it because if you're running an ODE and your score is very irregular, maybe crazy things can happen. I'm not sure. Um, certainly, if uh, you assume high enough derivatives, I guess that would imply this this condition. Um, yeah, maybe strictly speaking, they're not they're not exactly comparable. I, I guess uh, those higher order derivative papers. It's not just that you need a Jacobian bound, but you also, of course, need the original score error bound too. Yeah. I'm not sure how exactly to to compare them. Yes. I have a question that's very similar to what I asked before. So the dimension dependence here is better if you think of L as a constant, but is that a fair assumption? Like, uh, shouldn't L depend on dimension as well? In which case, I think actually the dimension out dependence would be slightly worse still in the SD. Uh, no. So in the SD, I had L squared. Right. So this actually improves the dependence on L as well. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. So under the same assumption here, do we know anything about the performance of SDEs? Uh, uh, whether there might be given the same infinite number of iterations? Or you, you mean the stronger assumptions up here? Uh, the, the results for the SDE are the same as the ones I listed before. Like the SDE just doesn't need these stronger assumptions. But yeah, it gets the iteration complexity scaling as L squared D over over epsilon squared. So this improves in all three parameters. OK, so I'll say a little bit about the proof, but this is more for the morbidly curious. So what are the ingredients that go into this? The first one is um, related to this path regularity that Yu Chen mentioned. So you, you need the true score function to be stable with respect to time. If your true score function is, is changing too rapidly, then you can't hope to discretize this process and, and get some guarantee. right? So uh, in this diffusion model literature, this was known as a score perturbation bound. It turns out that the previous bounds on this score perturbation bottleneck the complexity already at D. So you can hope to get better than D just with those bounds. Uh, the first thing we did was we proved an improved version of this score perturbation bound, which uh, doesn't have the same bottleneck, so it lets you get to square root D. Uh, but the problem is this bound deteriorates as you start reaching the end of your reverse process. This like leads us to consider some kind of modified uh, step size schedule. And then it gets kind of complicated, but uh, we'll, we'll brush all those details under the rug. The reason why I wanted to mention this, though, is that actually the score root D uh, bound for the score perturbation is kind of tight. You can check on a Gaussian example, which means that square root D is actually like, seems to be like a, a natural limit to what you can prove about these uh, diffusion models. OK. Um, as I mentioned, the OD suffers a smaller discretization error. 
So in particular, if you split this full time interval into chunks of size 1 over L, so what, what is 1 over L? Because like the scores are L Lipschitz, 1 over L is kind of the stability limit for a coupling analysis. If you go longer than 1 over L, then you'll start to uh, diverge apart exponentially, uh, exponentially fast. But if you stay within this stability limit, then it turns out within each chunk, if I just want to control the W2 error, it already suffices to take the step size of order 1 over square root d. So that's good. Uh, one one uh, small comment also is that, uh, OK, so I, I'm going to first talk about the, the predictor corrector framework. So when we add the predictor corrector, then you also have to think about the discretization of the stochastic corrector. And in order for the stochastic corrector to match this kind of dependence, you also need a fancier corrector, which is why I didn't talk about what exactly it is, but it's like an underdamped version of this, of this Langevin Monte Carlo. OK, but this is promising. The problem is like we can only do this analysis up until time 1 over L, and then we need to do this for many, many chunks. And the, the main issue that I mentioned that we want to avoid is how do we prevent these errors from compounding exponentially in time. So the, the main idea is that if you consider this corrector, uh, and let's say that p hat is, is like uh, one step of the predictor plus the corrector, then you can show that it satisfies this kind of regularity bound. So what does this regularity bound say? It says that if I start at x versus I start from y, I can control the KL divergence between an uh, application of this, of this kernel p hat. So why is this regular? It means I started with a Dirac mass at x versus a Dirac mass at y, which are definitely singular with respect to each other. But after I run this predictor corrector, the noise from the diffusion gives me a nice smooth distribution where the KL divergence is, is controlled. So somehow, like um, once you have KL, then you can hope to do some, something similar to the, the proof in the, in the stochastic case. And of course, you have to figure out like, how to actually compose these regularity bounds together to come up with the final proof. And this is using this technique of shifted composition that I've been developing with my co-author Jason Ochiller at UPenn. So we kind of started this in this first paper on shifted composition. So what is the idea here is that uh, I want to control the KL divergence, let's say, between the two block processes. Think of them as reverse OU and the and the uh, algorithm. But I only care about the KL divergence, let's say, at, at the end. So because of that, another way to control this KL divergence is to introduce this auxiliary process, which um, as long as this auxiliary process exactly equals one of the two processes at the final time, then computing the KL divergence between the original two processes is, is the same thing as the KL between the auxiliary process and the other process. And why, why is this auxiliary process nice? It's because um, the way that we compute this KL is basically via the KL chain rule, which depends on the entire path. So it will depend not just on the endpoint, but like how you got there. And the auxiliary process facil facilitates this computation. In particular, this auxiliary process is going to follow the, the algorithm's predictor corrector. But we're going to shift it so that it does hit the reverse OU at the final time. And the, the reason why this kind of works is you can control the, the KL divergence between this auxiliary process and the algorithm using like a Gersonov type bound. And this is because of the, uh, this KL regularity fact that I showed you on the previous slide. So somehow this KL regularity fact is what underlies the use of, of these kind of Gersonov techniques. OK, so that was very vague. But that's kind of the idea is that the corrector gives you this regularity that lets you prove this. OK, but I also stated a, a theorem for the probability flow OD, which had no stochastic corrector. So how do you, how do you um, apply this technique in that case? Uh, I guess it's kind of a mystery, but uh, you, can, uh, you can actually define the auxiliary process to use in the other way around. So instead of using the algorithm's predictor, you use the ideal predictor, but then you shift it towards the algorithm instead. So wh why does this work? It's because the ideal predictor which is the probability flow D, is equivalent to the stochastic implementation of the diffusion model. And the stochastic implementation does satisfy this regularity. So come, somehow you can leverage this. But there's a, 
an issue with this argument, which is that the auxiliary process, in this case, necessarily will never exactly hit the algorithm. So in the end, you do not get a KL bound between the algorithm and the ROU, which is to be expected. But you can, you can bound the KL between the algorithm and the, sorry, and between the auxiliary process and the, and the ROU. So you get a KL bound there. And you can also argue that the algorithm is close to the auxiliary process in W2. So you have, it's like W2 close to something that's KL close. And then what is kind of like the, the minimum of both W2 and, and KL, this is kind of where this bounded Lipschitz uh, metric shows up. Uh, anyway, that's all I want to say. So uh, there is, I think, um, a nice mathematical framework for thinking about diffusion models. But I think the real questions to study here are really the score estimation question. And I think we should think about this more in the future. And uh, this, the, also like these, the reason why I revisited this uh, application to the probability flow ODE is mostly as an application of this shifted composition technique that I'm working on. So there's other applications of this. Yeah, thank you. Really nice, thank you very much. Uh, we already had a couple of questions, but we have time for a few more. Yeah, maybe let's uh, come back to you. Okay, thank you so much for your very nice talk. Um, so I guess regarding the score Lipschitz assumption, um, you know, like there is this Benton at all, they use like this stochastic localization technique to like show that they can still get a bound for SDE without assuming the score function is Lipschitz. Um, do you have any intuition, like whether your framework can somehow incorporate this technique to like remove the smoothness conditions? Uh, you're talking about in the case of the deterministic implementation. Yeah, yeah or no maybe idea. adding some. <laughs> yeah, okay. I have no idea. I see. Oh, and by the way, my final condition is the estimated score function is Lipschitz. <laughs> the third condition for the information. Yeah, so we need the Lipschitzness of the score in space, but then also you need it. You need control in time, and I think that's your path regularity. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And the third condition is the estimated score function is also Lipschitz. So I need the true score as Lipschitz, and also the estimated score is Lipschitz. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe Omar, I think we had a question too. Um, maybe this is a stupid question, but do we know anything about like lower bounds or in terms of like number of steps? Uh, do we need do we need to run? Okay, so lower bounds. Um, if you want a lower bound against these sampling results, then maybe you want to formulate like an oracle model. So this oracle model might be like you get access to evaluations of the score. How many evaluations of the score do you need? I think that's a reasonable question, but the problem is that this. Framework requires evaluating the score at different times along your forward trajectory. And yeah, I'm just not sure what exactly a reasonable model for this is. Like, should you only allow, should you just count like score evaluations at any time to all be the same? Or, yeah, but I think that would be an interesting question to study. Thank you. Thank you. That was crystal clear. So there are Several sampling algorithms, there's the SDE, the ODE, predictor character, and we can imagine interpolating between all of these. And for all of these, there's the choice of the discretization, what kind of steps do we use, what kind of integrator. So what's your sense here on the alignment between theory and practice here? Do we understand what kind of, given a compute budget, what is the best algorithm, best discretization, and things like that? Or is this more, like in practice, we still try things out and we take the best one? Like what's, what's your assessment of the situation? Uh, yeah, so I think this is pretty divorced from practice. I think this is prescribing a number of steps which is way larger than what we would use in practice. Plus, like, in practice, like, there are a lot of things that seem to matter, like the choices that matter, which wouldn't show up in the theory. Maybe you would say like, you're off by a constant factor or something. We, we don't really have that kind of granularity. Yeah, I would say this is more just about um, what's like the basic way of thinking about these models, but then we really need to probe deeper to understand what's, what's going on in practice. OK, thank you. We have time for one last question. Yes.
Hi, I have a question about the corrector. I guess uh, it's a bit more practical question. Um, I guess you kind of rely on the fact that uh, you can estimate the, uh, like you know the score very well. But like in practice, like if you don't know this, like do you know if like you still get benefits from using the corrector or like can it kind of, you know, like mess up your walk from like, you know, the Gaussian distribution to the target distribution? Uh, well, I can't, I can't speak about um, what happens in practice uh, about this, but let me just mention that in theory, the reason why we do the corrector step is actually, like in the analysis, it's not actually to get closer to your distribution, because like in order to actually get closer to your distribution, you would need, say, log concavity or some kind of other assumption that guarantees mixing. But under these assumptions, you're so pessimistic that you don't actually mix. So the real role of the corrector in our analysis is actually to bring some regularity from the noise. So if you believe this theory, then you might think like actually corrector can still help just because injecting noise helps stabilize your process. But you want to inject noise in the right way. Like you don't want to just add isotropic noise because that would take you farther away. Somehow doing this MCMC lets you add noise in a way that hopefully doesn't take you too, uh, too far astray. Okay, thank you very much. Then let's thank all the speakers of this session again.